Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I am Susan Labadee, board member of CISNA. Thank you for joining us today. I am going to introduce to you Sister Ivana Zeklovska, who is a youth development professional with the BA in secondary education and an MA in youth development. She is a dreamer and an innovator who envisions and works toward building a world where youth are supported and empowered to becoming caring, responsible, and productive members of society in service of their community and their creator. Over the past 15 years, Ivana has served in multiple capacities and efforts to bring her vision to life. She is broadcasting from Ohio. I am in Chicago. And so take it away, Sister Ivana. Assalamualaikum. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, my name is Ivana and I am in Ohio. I've been here for the last seven, eight years. I kind of grew up in, uh, well, I kind of, I've been a little bit all over the place. I was born and raised in Eastern Europe. I'm Macedonian originally but then came uh, to the States in um, high school when I was 15 um, here in Ohio. Then college took me to Chicago, then grad school took me to Michigan and now I'm back. I found my way back to Ohio. So I have all different kinds of experiences. I'm familiar with the immigrant experience. So that kind of also informs some of the programming that I've done. I've worked with, uh, Muslim youth, I've worked with our masjids. Um, I've been just around all over the place, as Sister Susan said, trying to bring this vision of positive youth development to life. And so I'm really honored to be invited here and to share with you some, some things, hopefully beneficial things um, that you can take and actually implement in your schools. Um, I was asked to speak on youth culture and um, also more specifically with COVID, I was thinking I'm going to introduce you, to you um, things that you can do to build resilience in your classroom. Um, so inshallah with that, I will just start my presentation. Um, some of the things that we're going to cover, as I mentioned, is just um, basic um, defining what is adolescence. This is mostly where a lot of you are. Some of you are uh, working with younger children, uh, but I'm going to focus more on that adolescent 12 to maybe, let's say, 20 um, years old. Youth culture, change of perspective, youth and COVID and then supporting re resilience in the classroom. So adolescence, uh, this is the period where children transition from being a child to being um, not an adult quite yet. So this is the in-between time when they um, are shifting from concrete understanding of the world, very black and white understanding of the world and their own behavior and in, in, in interactions to a more complex and abstract one. So this allows the young people that you work with to see themselves in a whole new way, but it can also lead to developing inaccurate self-concepts sometimes. There's an inflated, um, confidence sometimes. Um, so they will try uh, certain things that we might see as risky behaviors because they, they're, they're saying, I can, I can jump from that. That's not too high. <laughs> and we're here saying, don't, no, 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 don't jump. You're not ready for that. You don't have the right tools. Um, but knowing that that's where they are helps us understand where some of these behaviors come from. And it helps us understand what we can do to help with that as well. Um, so adolescence is that time period where youth engage in a lot of identity development um, and negotiation and sometimes even renegotiation. So it's an ongoing process that continues through adulthood. Um, and there is a German American developmental psychologist um, named Eric Erickson. And um, he's kind of like a big figure in the theory of psychological development of human beings. And he views this development of a coherent, whole person, like a, a person identity to be the chief challenge of adolescent years. Everything they do and everything they will try to do is coming from that um, desire to figure out who they are and who they want to be. So adolescents work through many complexities um, to find their own identity. They, um, in, they question a lot of things, they, they question things about their appearance, their education, their career choices, um, aspirations, relationships, everything is fair game. For the first time, they might be 
starting to question their parents and the things that they, maybe they took for granted. It's parents said this, this is the truth. All of a sudden, now because they're able to think abstractly, they're starting to question those things. And it could be frustrating for, student, for teachers, it could be frustrating for parents, but this is, it, it's not stemming from a place of wanting to rebel, it's stemming from a place of wanting to understand, okay, which parts of this do I actually believe? Which parts of these, uh, which elements of what my parents and my teachers have taught me do I actually accept as true for myself? And this is actually healthy. Um, being able to make decisions positive decisions is a healthy part of the development. And a lot of times teachers or parents, we might have the urge to want to stunt this because, hey, what I, I have the best intention. I have your best interest in mind. I'm telling you this is what's best for you. This is what you should be doing. And so we might want to stop them from doing certain things because we don't want them to make mistakes. We don't want them to get hurt. But that actually develops a stunted, that stunts growth and it's actually unhealthy. Um, so there is an increased complexity to the group interactions. Um, and you might see this manifest in terms of cliques, uh, people excluding other people, because again, it's coming from the effort of wanting to find belonging and then wanting to figure out what is my in-group? Where do I belong? Who, what defines me? Which parts of this is me and what is not me? Because as a child, you don't have a separate sense of self from the world. The world and you are one and the same. But as you grow, there's this development of the I that comes in and then it really um, gets inflated during adolescence once again. Um, so, youth, defining youth culture within everything that we talked about is this messy business of finding their way. And when we think about youth culture in this way, it helps us understand that um, it's not something that we should look upon as a negative thing. It's something that can actually helps us, help us understand the youth in our lives, be it our students, be it other youth who are uh, part of our life. It refers to the cultural practices of the members of this age group um, by which they express their identity and demonstrate their sense of belonging. As I said, um, they usually will belong to a particular group. Um, they will choose to belong to a particular group or they will be put in a particular group just by the environment around them. And this is why Youth culture has a very strong emphasis on things like clothes, things like popular music, sports, vocabulary. And a lot of us who might not have that understanding, we might think, oh, why are they dressing this way? I mean, they're just trying to defy me. They're trying to defy the rules of our school. Why are they listening to this? Why are they speaking this? So why are they texting? What is this? What are, what are these words that they're using? What is fleet? <laughs> what is drip? What are, what are all these? What's FOMO, right? All these things that they're using. And actually, there's been academic papers written back and forth about how um, do our youth, our young people destroying language. <laughs> and I mean, actually, research shows that, you know, although there is that part of adolescence where, you know, obviously language changes most of them um, outgrow and it's not long enough for it to actually change the language. Although some words like dude <laughs> has stuck around for a very long time. Um, and it actually doesn't mean what it used to mean um, when it first was introduced. So defining youth culture can be a challenging task uh, because of the fact that culture uh, in general is such a vague term to begin with. It's really difficult to explain culture. You can talk about some of the things that you observe that mani are manifestations of that culture or that influence it. But if you start to actually define culture, it could be very vague and difficult. So there are elements like music, dress, language, food, and others that shape culture in general and youth culture more specifically. They will vary depending on uh, which group you're part of, which subgroup of that group you're part of. Um, 
And individuals can identify with a variety of social groups, um, as I mentioned, either due to their own volition or because they've been imposed uh, certain labels and they've been put in certain boxes. Um, additionally, one thing to keep in mind, this is the same, this is true for young people as it is for most of us, that many of us identify with more than just one social identity at a time. Um, we're not just Muslim, we're not just American, we're not just um, one, we're not just female or male, we're not just certain things. We are many things at the same time. And a lot of the research on identity development does focus on only one thing at a time, which can be limiting. So there's this concept called hybrid identities, um, which are, um, you know, they kind of merge two or more different identities. You can have the religious and the national identity together. Um, and it does it in a way where it seamless, seamlessly becomes a whole. And that's what we want. Um, fragmented identity development happens when you don't get the right support. So for example, um, because a lot of you are in Islamic school or in Masajid, this happens a lot, if you don't provide the right type of support for this type of negotiation and figuring out what part of this is me, what can happen is you can have like this fragment, you can have a splinted identity where they are a certain way at school, but they're a certain way with their friends who are not part of that school. Um, or they're one part with their families and they're another part with their schools, uh, with, their, with their friends. And that's actually an unhealthy way to be. What we want to try to encourage is a whole way of being, that they can bring their whole selves to every situation that they're in, in every setting that they're in. So um, there's little mystery that many adults do not look fondly um, towards youth, unfortunately. Um, there's a negative attitude towards young people and it's evident in the media that we consume. It is, um, uh, you know, it, it, the news and what is actually focused, what we focus on in the news when it comes to young people. Um, a lot of times you'll hear statistics like 27% of all young people are at risk of something, right? But what you're not considering is that 70 some percent are doing really well, right? So what we focus on usually has the ability to influence how we're going to talk about youth development. And because of the way we talk about youth development, it's going to help, you know, if we see it as a negative thing, we're going to try to control it versus try to encourage it. Um, so then there are all those adults who might not see, obviously, youth in a negative, and I'm hoping that's all of you. You do not see youth in a negative light, but just simply don't understand them. And this is where we can definitely help. Um, so despite the efforts, I would like to think of popular media and political, some political agendas to define youth culture as selfish and lazy and violent. Um, youth are members of many groups of subgroups that shape their identity. And um, they're actually, uh, statistics show us, a lot more engaged than generations before them. They are, um, they want to do social good. They want to be, involved in uh, service. They are involved in service. They are looking for opportunities to be part of society. Um, so a lot of them are doing a lot better than we would have we would have been made to believe. But similar to the inability of defining American adult culture, for example, uh, because of its diversity, um, it's impossible to define American youth culture to as a whole, um, and let alone just youth culture um, and more specifically. But um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight that there is no one youth culture here. It all looks different by the generation, by the kid, right? What they identify as. And we have to do the hard work of getting to know the youth in our lives. Um, Okay, not there yet. Um, so while they're trying to be independent, and this is where some of the push is going to come from, well, I can do this. You don't know. You don't understand, right? Befa uh, while they're trying to be independent, they also need the security and safety from adults around them 
as they're trying to figure this thing out, as they're trying to figure out their place in the world, who they are and who they want to be. They need to know that they, you are a safe place to fall back on when they inevitably will make mistakes. And then you're gonna help them um, frame those mistakes, make sense of them, learn from them and move through them. So um, elements of what makes up their culture can be used if you understand it, um, not to put them in a box, but to help teach them, help them navigate through meaning. So for example, um, and I know that there is, there is a difference in opinion in terms of music, um, and there, there's obviously still music that you can use, but music can be used to promote academic liter literacy. Um, especially if you are teaching in an urban school, hip hop culture and music can definitely be used. And there's some good stuff out there um, that can be used to teach, um, you know, as teachers in the new century schools, you must meet this challenge and find ways to form meaningful relationships with your students. Um, and they come from different worlds and you have to understand those worlds that they're coming from. And when they see themselves represented in your classroom, there are elements of themselves represented in your classroom rather than those elements seen as negative and shunned, they are more likely to actually engage with the material and learn. So while we're trying to help youth and students develop academic skills and the skills that they need to become critical thinkers and criti critical citizens of this global world and a multicultural de democracy, we can use some of these elements um, I've actually taught a class through, um, I think it was a Lupe Fiasco song where he sang about, um, I think it was the Palestine, he had a Palestine song. And you can bring this stuff into the classroom. You can teach different concepts like metaphor, tone, theme, feminism, history, all these other topics through some of that stuff. Also another element is technology. I bring these two because they seem to be as examples because they seem to be the most scary to older people or um, people who might not be as familiar. Um, so this is where we're like, you know what? I'm not familiar with this stuff, so it's scary. It's very easy for us to be scared by something that we don't know. This is why it's good to get to know some of the things that scare us, but music and technology. So technology has a huge impact on forming identity, relationship, and lived realities of our youth, we, whether we like it or not. It's just what's happening. So being able to, it's a technology is a tool. Like a hammer, you can use it to build a house or destroy a house. So it's a tool. It's all about how you actually use it. So while technological innovations have influenced youth culture and youth development, they have made relationship between adults and youth a more difficult thing to tackle sometimes. Um, this is especially true with adults who insist on viewing these innovations as something that should be stopped rather than as something that can be used to benefit youth. Um, so especially as teachers and other adults who work with youth, um, we must be aware of the newest innovations in youth culture, um, be it in technology or music, um, in order to be able to facilitate this positive development that we want to see. Um, it's important to keep in mind that um, although as adults, we might not always be able to understand or agree with everything of, that youth are into, um, but they have to always be aware that um, of what those things are in order to be able to use them as tools to facilitate this type of relationship. So all this to say is that what I'm trying to kind of lead you into is a shift in perspective, how we look upon um, youth culture, youth development, and just youth themselves, right? Um, do we think of youth as problems to be solved? Or do we think as youth of youth as resources to be developed? And I'm hoping that by the end of my presentation, we're all in the resources camp for youth. That we understand that no matter where youth are coming from, they bring certain strengths with them that we can build upon and develop. Um, Adults, a lot of times we might think that teens today are different than they were in the past. 
Um, at the core of this concept is the feeling that today's youth have rejected our values or these traditional values. Um, at, at the core of it might be fear of where we're heading or what decisions they're making. Um, the overwhelming assessment for adults um, are that kids are either troubled or troubling, uh, or that, you know, that they are trouble or that they themselves are troubled, um, that there are problems to be solved. Um, and this will, as I mentioned before, influence not only how we think about and view the young people themselves, it will affect how we interact with them. It will affect uh, what we expect from them and it will affect how we teach them. Um, and this is, this is not something I'm saying, this is something that research has shown this type of age prejudice. Um, and it's not unique to our generation. It happened, our parents probably said the same thing to us and their parents said to them. Um, so it's an age prejudice, which is when combined with systemic and institutional power is called adultism. So kind of like racism, where when you have race prejudice combined with systemic power, when you have the age prejudice combined with systemic power, that's called adultism. And there's lots of research papers on this. And when you look through these lens, young people are always citizens in the making. They're our future. They're practicing for the real thing without any real power or valued opinions. Um, and it, I'm gonna stop here to acknowledge that youth today are faced with some challenges that maybe we did not face. Their challenges look different. Maybe they are not facing the exact same way that we did. But at the core of it, they're still negotiating their identity and they're doing it in public in a way that we did not. They're figuring out who they are in a, on public platforms. So their stupid teenage mistakes are put in historical records and that's scary. That's something that's a little bit new and unique. It, everything is out there for everyone to see. We've done a lot of the things that they might be doing, a lot of the same mistakes, right? When we were negotiating our identity, but no one knows about it because it was not on Instagram. It was not on um, wherever they are, on TikTok. So we need to recognize that they aren't worse than us or misbehaving more than us. They're just doing it publicly which previous generations did privately. <laughs> um, with that said, with the advent of social media, new platforms, new technology, there's new ones popping up, it seems like every other day. Um, they, are, they have um, different tools at their disposal to kind of create, express, and navigate their culture. And that's okay. As long as we try to at least become familiar with those platforms and what, the, what, what, what is going on, you don't have to participate. But if you are open enough, if you make yourself that safe place, young people, all they really need is someone to be willing to listen and they are going to tell you everything you need to know. Um, so starting point um, with, for all, anything and everything we hope to do in with youth is absolute respect and unconditional love for the human being in front of me. Recognizing that this soul in front of me was created by the same creator that created me and that they have infinite potential to become the best version of themselves. Because if when, for example, the prophet came to Mecca and even Medina, right? If he just saw what was, he would have said, forget it. Like if you look at Omar and who he was, rather than who he can become, you, you're going to just give up. So they, they have infinite potential to become better. So we, um, we will more often than not fall short of this ideal right? But it's a great one to aspire to and check ourselves against it and ask, why not? What's getting in the way? Why am I struggling with this person? Why, why can't I have unconditional love for this child? And one thing in uh, youth development, positive youth development, there's this uh, researcher named Benson. He, he wrote a book called um, All Our Kids, I believe. 
And he says, like, it, the, one of the starting points has to be that we see all kids as our kids. It's not just these kids here. It's not just Muslim kids, it's not just my own biological kids, but that all kids need all these supports to be able to develop because when they do, the entire society, the entire community improves. So effective youth work and the understanding of youth in general requires understanding of the self sometimes. It's where we can start. Uh, a better grasp of our reactions and perspectives. Um, it requires introspective way of thinking. Um, to think when, when you're faced with an, a, a, a situation in your classroom, for example, is this child, child truly being disobedient or unmotivated? Or is something else going on here? Sometimes it could be that they're just unmotivated and disobedient. That's okay. But asking that question, is there something else going on? Because most of the time what they bring to the classroom is not just uh, what you're seeing. There's so much more. There's so many other systems that affect their development and they're bringing all of that into your classroom. You know, we have to ask ourselves, do our students feel seen by us, by our curriculum? Do they feel heard? Do they feel valued? Do, do they feel like their opinion matters? Um, and so, you know, youth are not vessels to be filled, they're fires to be lit. Youth are fires to be lit and our job is to help them find that spark, not snuff it out. When you see that spark sometimes manifest as disobedience in your classroom, ask what is rubbing them the wrong way or maybe it's that you know start of that spark of something because when i go into a masjid that has put as an example in this case <laughs> a pet peeve of mine right if i go to a masjid where women have been put in a coat closet that you have to like do some ninja movements to get to you're going to see disobedience perhaps right that's how it's going to manifest but for me it's injustice right maybe i am maybe the young person you're seeing in your classroom they're motivated by certain injustices that they see the things that bother them the things that inspire them they're uniquely placed there i believe by our creator because perhaps they have the tools or they're the person that were chosen to do something about that and our job as the adults in their life is to actually empower that to light them up to, to find those unique strengths that they have and build them up. Um, and we know that the best of human development happens from inside out. We can't just, you know, we are, because we have so much information at our fingertips, you know, we have our phones in three seconds, you can get any information you want. Our job as teachers isn't to amass information anymore. It's not to just keep putting, keep putting, keep putting. It's to teach them how to actually evaluate that information. How do you take this information and create a new thought? How do you critically evaluate this thing? How do you critically think about it? What do I do with this? It's not just ABC, okay, I've memorized it, let me regurgitate. That's no longer the, the function of education. And I don't think I have to tell you this, this, you guys are in the field. With all that in mind, with everything that's happening, in adolescence, all this development stuff and belonging and needing for belonging, COVID happens. <laughs> so young people's lives have been disrupted by COVID. And because this is such a critical stage of their physical, cognitive, social, emotional development, um, they're especially affected by this disruption. Um, well, there are certainly certain academic skills and knowledge students need to catch up on, and we might feel pressured because some of our funding might come through the testings and the results that we're producing. We have to pay attention to the whole child. We are in the business of the whole self. This is, you know, this is where I'm hoping being part of an Islamic school as Muslims, we're able to decide that, you know what, there is still a pandemic. Life is not normal. And trying to pretend that it is, it doesn't work for young people. Um, it doesn't work for anyone, but especially for young people sitting in your classroom. Um, they've been isolated for 18 months and they need to be eased into the classroom again. Um, you know, do icebreakers, do community building. Community building is going to be essential. Don't come in hot, uh, no matter how stressed you might feel about the curriculum benchmarks that you feel you need to um, meet, students might need more time. 
and they, they will definitely need a lot more flexibility. Asking them where they are and seeing how you can pick up from there and help them grow. So through positive youth development, um, you know, we have some advice on how to offer proper support um, to enable our young people to be resilient in the face of these and other challenges that are going to come. As I said, it's not um, ideal to save them from everything. They, this is actually how they were, this is how they learn. This is how they build up resilience and resilience is the capacity to rise above their circumstances. And you know, you can have two um, children facing the exact same circumstances and one of them is thriving and the other one's not. What's the difference? Is this resilience? So this is a trait um, that allows us to exist in a less than a perfect world <laughs> um, while we're also moving forward with optimism and confidence. It's this ability to bounce back, depending, no matter what has been dealt to us, that we're able to take it, um, absorb it, adapt to it, and transform. So we define resilience as the ability of individuals, families, systems, communities to, particularly in crisis and conflict affected contexts, to reduce these risks, to manage them. This is the absorb, the absorptive. I think I have a slide for that. Uh, the absorptive, we want them to be able to absorb the shock, um, then to enhance assets and agency. This is adaptive. So in order to adapt, young people must be able to recognize the shock, right, and the stressor and make an intentional decision on how to prepare for and respond to the stressor. Um, this is the proactive way. So the next time something like this happens, you already know, okay, I'm able to recognize this is a stressor. This is what I've decided last time I'm going to do when this happens to me, right? So they're able to adapt quicker. And then the last kind of level is transformative. And it's built over time through making those mistakes, through going through stressful um, situations, this transformative capacity is built upon time and uh, characterizes the stage when one person is inspired to propel change, right? At the individual level, at the community level, um, at the systems level, right? For youth, most likely probably at the individual level to reduce these risks. So it might manifest as young people realizing that you know, our community is over-policed and I'm going to do something about it because every time I get stopped by a cop, this is a stressor and it's affecting me a certain way. Um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to do something about it to decrease the effect of the threats that we know. So um, this is the intent to fundamentally alter the status um, so that the individual can be better off uh, before the than before the adversity took place. So these are kind of levels. Most of the young people are going to probably be still dealing with the first and maybe our role would be to move them into that second one. And ideally, if you really are able to kind of help them become adaptive, then you can start pushing them into start to think about big picture. Well, what can we do about this? Um, as teachers who are part of the school system um, where youth spend a large portion of their day um, in person or virtual, we have the opportunity to build this type of systemic resilience um, to enhance our young people's strengths. This is not only for the benefit of the students, as I said, uh, but also for our communities, our schools, they, be, they benefit from engaged and empowered youth. Um, we all benefit, our entire society benefits from youth who are meaningfully able to contribute to the social good. Um, so in positive youth development, we always start from a place of strength. We always want to help young people see the strengths that they already have. And we need to help them recognize what other things do they need uh, you know, on their plate to be able to develop in a positive way. We believe that youth are resources. Uh, with certain strengths and ability to build, uh, to build upon them. We honor their intelligence that they bring um, and we honor the potential that's within them for growth. We meet the child where they are. This is so important. And one thing, um, whenever I think about this, it helps me remember 
if you read the autobiography of Malcolm X, he talks about how Islam wasn't this thing out there that he had to reach for, this like unattainable ideal. He said, Islam reached down into the dirt and picked me up. So we have to make this something that's accessible, something that's desirable. So we meet the child where they are. And then we don't stop there. We interact with them, keeping in mind of the person who they can become. And we pull them up that way. We try saying, I know you can blank because you have already shown me how you can blank. Help them see that they can actually do that. For example, if you, um, let's say, if you find a way to forgive your friend, Muhammad, for messing up this time, because you've always shown so much understanding to your little brother. If you know they're like, if you actually invest yourself in the lives of your students and you know some things like this, you can bring them in to realize that this is the same skill, you can just apply it here now. And that helps them grow in a different setting. Um, students possess the ability to problem solve, but we must guide them to do it in a way that matches their stage of development. And this is why if you have not taken a refresher or if you've never taken um, you know, child and youth development, it's important to know their stages. It's important to know where they are biologically, where their cognitive development is, to know what is appropriate, what is the appropriate way to present the same information. If you present it at a level that's not appropriate, they're not going to benefit. Right. If my child asks me at five something and they ask me the same question at 15, obviously the way I would present that information would be very different. But I would have to know what is developmentally appropriate. I have to understand that young people's uh, frontal cortex is still developing and that part of the brain is responsible for long term decision making, for consequence thinking. This is why young people sometimes think oh, I want to do this because it's going to make me feel good now. And that's not because they're selfish. It's because that part of the brain doesn't stop developing till mid-20s. So they're still figuring that out. They can't think, you know, a lot of us as adults, we're like, you have to think long-term. You know, if you pick your friends this way now, you know, when you're 30, it's going to make you be this type of person. They, well, they're not thinking when they're 30. They're thinking having these friends now, it's going to make me be in the in crowd. And that's what I want. No child at this time wants to be different. But what do we do? Be proud of being different. You know, you're a Muslim, you should not be ashamed of your hijab. But understanding that they just want to like fly under the radar and not be picked on and just be the same. At this, especially early adolescence, they don't want to be different. <laughs> Knowing that helps us not take it personally when they reject some things or they, when they have a hard time with certain things. It's not because they hate Islam. It's not because they hate hijab. It's because they're just, they just want to not be picked on maybe, you know? Um, so know what they need um, and know that they need certain concepts broken down for them in a step-by-step -step fashion. This doesn't mean you dumb it down in your classroom. You don't dumb down the information, but maybe you, the way you help them get there is a little bit different. You, you say, okay, so from here to here, where, how do you get there? Now from here, you can just kind of guide them until they get to where they need to be. And as adults, sometimes it's easy to slip into solving the problems for our students. We want to jump in because we know from our own experiences that likely there, there are likely consequences of their choices and we want to sometimes save them. Many adults, we launch into lecture mode. Um, as soon as we sense any problem, any trouble on the horizon, the problem is that when we lecture, our children don't hear our message. Um, they're hearing the tone. They're not hearing the information you're giving them. This is because when we're talking to them in this way, they don't understand our complex reasoning that we're giving them. Um, for teens of all ages, they can't hear the complexity of the, that what you're trying to communicate is anxiety or stress or worry. They, uh, they get 
they all they think all the thing all that they get from hearing that is that we just don't get them. We don't understand. They get that they're ang- that we are angry, but they don't understand why. So it's just not an effective way to communicate your message or even displeasure. And a lot of times fear, fear of failure is the best way to crush competence building. And there's a lot of research. Uh, competence is positive views about uh, the ability to act effectively in school and other social um, situations. It's one of the six C's that positive youth development wants to see as outcome for our children. And com- I'm only focusing on competence more specifically because it's directly linked to building resilience for people. Um, and failure, fear of failure crushes this competence um, and resilience, therefore. Um, a sense of competence helps uh, with building resilience. Competence is earned, though. It's not something that's given. Um, it has to be through actual experiences. This is not some abstract, can-do spirit that you bring to your classroom. Um, there are no shortcuts to experience. Students need to be given the space and opportunity to develop these skills, um, to trust their judgment, to make responsible choices. And our job as teachers is to provide them with a platform for it. Um, If they don't make the mistakes now, then when? You know, how are they supposed to learn? This does not, I mean, in math, right? We give them problems on purpose because we want them to make those mistakes so that when the test comes, they know how to deal with that. Same thing with all the life skills. This does not always look like more though. Um, It could be less, getting out of the way. Sometimes it's enough. Um, Trust them to make decisions and to take chances. Our job is to set and model guidelines that provide these safe boundaries. And so for me, I think the the last message I'm hoping to leave you with is be their safe space as much as you can. I know, again, we're talking about an ideal. We're talking, you probably have over 20 kids in each of your periods. There's a lot going on. Teachers are overworked, overstressed, underpaid. I I say all this with the understanding of that reality as well. I was in my first period class that I was teaching a few years ago, out of 20 some, 25, six kids that I had in that period, I think six or seven of them had individual IEP plans. And I had a student who, who would write pain and, and something else, I can't remember, on his knuckles. And I knew he was living in a home for boys and there was so much going on and I'm here, let's conjugate verbs, you know? <laughs> there, there is so much more going on. I recognize that reality. And this is why I'm hoping that some of these tools, some of this is tools that you can bring into your classroom. And if nothing more, you change the way that you look at your students. And I think that is going to be a long-term change because anytime you're faced with defiance or you're faced with a challenge, you're able to stop at least and think about this. What is going on here? Be their safe place, safe space. Let them know that you've got their back. Be open to listening and you'll be surprised how much they'll tell you. Um, I worked for MINA, the Muslim Youth of North America for about four or five years. Um, and I used to go to these camps and I wasn't even their counselor. I was a staff who would just be there. And because I had the reputation of someone they, that would listen, all kinds of, and they're meeting me for the first time. We've not built a relationship, which you have the privilege to build over a full school year. They would come out with all kinds of stuff. They will tell you, and you, and not saying I have so much to learn from you in a very like cliche kind of thing, but that truly really believe that you have a lot to learn from them as well. Youth are idealists in a way that we have we, we've lost it we know we know we live through life we see the reality of certain things and it just chips away at our idealism but it is youth where most meaningful change happens if you look at any revolutions if you look at any social change most of the time it starts on college campuses so 
instead of crushing that idealism, how can we empower them to actually make some good changes? Is they just long to be seen, to be heard, to be validated and to belong. This is really it. So if your curriculum, your interaction can touch upon some of that, allowing them to be seen, heard, validating their experience, because experience is not a logical proposition. Experience is real to the person who's experiencing it. Now you can, you know, reason your way out. You can tell them this is not true because and bring all the logical ex explanations. But the fact that they felt that way in a, through their experience is very real for them. And being able to recognize that and guide them through so that at the end, they feel like this is a place where I belong. We don't want to push our youth outside of the Islamic schools. I'm working with a community right now where they say, you know, we, they only come because we have an Islamic school. And as soon as they graduate, we don't see them at the masjid anymore. So we've not done a good job retaining them. We've not, they, they have not made a positive connection to our masjid. And so they're less likely to return as adults. Right. So we want them to we want to give them a place to belong. We want to make Islam part of their youth culture. We want to make Islam, you know, something that stays long after the cultural interpretations and um, practices have faded. Because if you base your instruction on values rather than rituals, this is what remains, that they know how to make decisions based on their values, no matter what situation that they've been dropped in. If you have tried to cultivate that in your classroom where we're learning this because this is our value, they're going to go to their friend and they're going to be offered drugs, they're going to be offered whatever, and they're going to say, I'm going to make this decision because of what I value, not because my dad's going to do this or my teacher's going to expel or whatever. Um, so that type of decision making is what we want to encourage in our classrooms. And that's all I had. I, I think I went over my half hour, but you did tell me that we didn't have any time restrictions. And I do pray that this was at least one something was beneficial here, if nothing more, that we're at least starting to think about this thing a little bit differently, that we're starting to self-evaluate and start from our own self, inshallah. Sister Ivana, you are gold. I am so grateful that you accepted our invitation to speak on behalf of youth culture and your expertise with Bath Youth. Um, so much resonated with me. You know, I come from the perspective of that teachers are, are in a sense, examples of, of the prophetic way. And the Prophet would never be judgmental of anyone. And many times our teachers have to remember that they have that role to play as well. Um, you know, I mentioned to you before we went on that uh, my kids now are like, you know, between mid twenties to early thirties, but you know, they're on TikTok and, and they'll send me some stuff sometimes. And they've always done that. Even when I was a teacher, it helped me a lot, stay in touch with what the youth culture was all about. So I could use a few of those like dude you know kind of terminologies the words and then I found too now that my kids are older when I go back into schools occasionally to do some uh teaching during like maternity leave so I stay in touch with the youth culture that they come up with stuff that I have no clue what that word means or what it's yeah. about but I can go and ask now that I've developed some rapport you know even if I'm there for the short term because I'm accepting of them I might not agree always with what their perspectives are, but I'm not going to be judgmental and they know that. So then I can go back to them and say, hey, guys, this happened. Can you explain that to me? And they're very willing to do that because I'll stay open to them. Do you have any suggestions? Um, two things come to mind. Where is it that the teachers can go? They're not really hanging out on Facebook anymore. I know that. But what Instagram, TikTok, are they on Triller? Um, and, and that's the first part. Where can like teachers get a little bit more insight to what their their culture is like, where they hang out? And second of all, when I've done school accreditations and, and visits, I find that the best schools are the schools where the students own their education themselves. And so do you have any advice for helping teachers promote that? 
Yeah. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to mention, um, it, it helped me think about this, the way you phrased your question is that youth value because they themselves are in that um, explorative phase and they want to be authentic, they value authenticity. So they can spot a fake <laughs> from miles away. So when adults try too hard, when adults are doing or saying things that just aren't part of who you authentically are, that's where you can be faced with them like snickering or, you know, like they want you to be open to them, but they don't expect you to yo bro it out with them either. <laughs> it's yo um, bra now, yo bra, yeah. not bro, that changed, yeah. <laughs> yes, bra. Um, you know, sometimes when I would be at these camps, like, Sister Vanna, do this move, and I'm like, girl, I can't move that way, like, but show me, like, show me how you do that, and I'm not going to do it, because to me, that looks silly, but I'm open to hearing you out, and so, yeah, the, I mean, nowadays, TikTok is what's blowing up. I'm not on TikTok, um, but I've, I've never felt the need to be on there to fully understand what's going on. Some of the youth will still send me things just because they think they, they understood my sense of humor. I have a very sarcastic sense of humor, a very European dry type of humor. And so because they knew that about me, they'll like send me links to things I'm like, oh, this made me think of you. And it builds the connection without me having to try to be on their I mean, what happened with Facebook is when all the adults got on there, youth got off. <laughs> I mean, Facebook is seen as a lot of us, we still promote our events to youth on Facebook. And they're like, I'm not even on Facebook. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, Instagram, they're still there-ish. Some of the older adolescents are still there. The younger ones are, they have Finstas <laughs> where this is their fake instant Insta. Um, and it's the one that they'll, they'll have one. It's the one that they send to parents and other adults. And then they have the Finsta, which is the one for their parent, for their peers. And that's where their uh, other stuff goes. And as I mentioned, TikTok, there are trends. I've seen teachers on TikTok. They are trying, but if that's who you authentically are and, you know, you can naturally be there that's fine too. Some of them have used that. Some of them have brought some of those dance moves to their classrooms. I saw most recently a teacher do the, I don't know what it is, it's called the fork or something, fork in the disposal, where he's getting their um, young, their, I think they're elementary school uh, students to get them moving in the morning. So he's like, let's do the fork in the disposal. And they're just all kind of going this way and that. And so he's brought some of that and it looked natural. It looked like the teacher was just really hip and up to date <laughs> with that. Um, and the second part of your question was, you know, owning the education. And this is where I was talking about um, youth are, their self-interest is their own development. If they find that opportunity in a positive space or negative space, they're going to take it. This is why, I mean, the most prevalent life period um, where youth join gangs is, it, it, you know, it's during this adolescence because it's still for the same sense of belonging and someone has given them this sense of belonging. They've, they've empowered them to make certain decisions to feel like they own their own development. So they're gonna seek that out no matter where. So this is why we want to give them a positive sense of that where they can develop it. Um, obviously, unfortunately, youth are not engaged in uh, decision making about curriculum or like what is being taught, but they can definitely be engaged in how that curriculum is applied to them, you know, choosing projects that are meaningful to them. Um, in my daughter's school, uh, they learn the Industrial Revolution through actually making chairs. Um, they have woodworking class. And then they have art class and then they have all these. So what the school does is they, bring, they at the beginning of every school year in eighth grade, because this is when they learn it, they are, there's a truck that comes and brings a huge log in the backyard. And then they work on cutting that log. They work on shaping the um, legs of the chair. They, in their handwork class, they weave the seat. 
Um, and what they're learning is that whereas in woodwork before each of your pieces were individual, mm -hmm. now everyone is making these legs and you can't tell which one's yours and which one was someone else's, this like line production. And so they're engaged in making something, they're owning the curriculum, they're learning about it in art class because they're drawing this out, they're learning in English because they're writing about it. So there's this like almost holistic approach to the curriculum so they can see themselves in the curriculum and they can actually apply it to their life and understand it. Um, it can come out, you know, at the more choices, this is what I've learned from when my kids were little, you always give them acceptable choices. So rather than saying you have to wear this or the other extreme, what do you want to wear? You say you may wear this or this, which one would you like? So you give them acceptable choices, but they're learning how to make a choice and then live with the consequences of that choice. So giving them choice, giving them voice is very mm -hmm. critical. Giving them okay. voice, voice, uh, youth voice is huge in, in the research of positive youth development uh, for empowerment. Got it. Any questions from anyone else in the audience? Here's your chance. Sure. This is a fabulous uh, talk, Jazakallah Khairan. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. First one, um, how do you balance authority and uh, your willingness to listen to youth? You know, uh, I'm, uh, we, uh, we struggle uh, in our school where we had, you know, some, some teachers, they, they're willing to, you know, uh, develop this bond with kids. And we have seen it, like kids would open up to those uh, teachers and will come and teachers will try to, you know, use that to, as you said, as you said to invest in those kids. And, and it has had great, like a great results, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, um, you know, the school has policies and, you know, and certain times those policies can be violated and you can decide, draw, where do you draw this, this line? Okay, this is a red line, you know, from uh, from uh, the uh, from the one who's involved in the youth, you would see uh, that person assessment of that situation. Oh, this line is not too big. It's not worth it. It's not worth to go through the, you know, you have to pick your battle, you know? Uh, wh where do you draw this line? How do you bring everybody in the school on that, uh, on that mission? This is a, uh, and we see it, you know, for us being from pre-K-3 to K-12, you know, it's really hard to bring everybody on the same boat. Okay, when you're in middle high schools, you have to, it's different from uh, pre-elementary and elementary. So how, how, how do you do that? Yeah, um, so I, it, it's, it comes from both sides, in my opinion. Um, a lot of times we have rules in our schools that maybe did not consider appropriate youth development. It might not, it maybe did not consider, um, maybe there was no input from youth and we've just made up all these rules that just make no sense. Some of them make no sense because they're good rules, but we've just not taken the time to explain to the youth why they are there. There's always going to be rules that they don't like but doesn't mean that we remove all of those either. Um, part of learning and part of real life, because we're preparing them for this, right? This is real life, is that there are real consequences to decisions that you make. Um, and this is why I said teaching them how to make decisions that are based upon principle will go a long way because they understand that when I make this decision, this is a consequence for that decision. But if it's based on values, I'm going to stick to that. Because sometimes, it, in, even in the larger political sense, certain laws are not just laws. And it took someone saying, you know what? It's not okay for us to own people. That was a law and it was accept It was actually illegal to free, to help free a slave. <laughs> but someone said, this is not a just law. So sometimes I think on the side of administrators, it takes some introspection to, to look at what are the rules that we have and what are they there for? Which ones do actually, do we really need? Which ones are just there and no one really understands? 
Um, I think that as we talked about youth voice and engagement, if you have a listening session with young people who are willing to talk to you, engage them in some of those decision making and not in a patronizing way, let's hear them out and still do what we want to do, but give them real accessible way of making change. So if enough of them are bothered by something, sit them down, hear them out, see if you can come up with a better choice. Uh, but again, that's not going to be for everything. There are going to be certain things that even by state law or whatever you are required to do, and they're going to have to learn consequences to their decisions as well. Any other questions? But um, if I may add, um, until people are thinking of other questions, you know, a lot of times because we know the rules and we want to save them from making mistakes, we kind of become authoritative. Um, it's a parenting style, it could be a teaching style. And unfortunately this just, it leads to students losing interest. Um, and then on the other hand, when you have teachers who are uh, trying too much to appease, as I said, you know, like there, you can tell that this person's trying too hard. They're trying to be their buddies. They're trying to be a youth themselves. They lose respect for that too. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance. You balance between guiding and then agency, giving them agency. Brother Anas, you had any other questions as well? Um... I don't know if, uh, from your experience with other Islamic schools, uh, uh, in terms of dress code at the, at the Islamic schools, you know, most Muslim schools, they have certain dress codes, uh, you know, especially for girls, like uh, to put a head cover. So how, how, do, how do you deal with the uh, issue of identity crisis, I call it, like when you have, like sometimes teachers, sometimes, you know, come to school, put on a headscarf, and they walk out of school, have no scared headscarf, and I have seen it in our own girls, like they go to college, you know, some of them, they're doing concurrent en enrollment at high school, like, you know, they step out of the school, mm -hmm. they go to the, the college and they, they don't have the same uh, identity. It's a totally different identity. Yeah. How, how do you deal with that? That's a tough one. I'm not even going to lie. Um, Personally, so this is not from a youth development perspective, but personally, I think it's very difficult to institutionalize um, a religion through, um, as I mentioned, like through your school, right? So, you know, you have a rule where they have to do part of a religion, like certain concept of that religion that they might not agree or very likely at this age, they just don't understand. So if it's part of the dress code, maybe working extra hard to explain why. Um, so at Mina, this is not an Islamic school, we do have, we did have the dress code it included um, headscarf. Regardless of how I feel about that, if I think it should or shouldn't be there, it was part of it. Um, so one thing that we worked on really hard, it was to explain that this is a training ground. This is something that should you choose to do for yourself, this is a safe space, space where you can try it out. Um, and just really allow them the space to explore that. Because when it feels forced or imposed from the outside, it becomes, again, hijab is a tool. And it can be used to empower, or it could be used to oppress and tear down. It, we've seen it, governments do it both ways. Um, so when there is no choice in it, it can feel like a, an oppressive uh, practice. So giving them the space to learn about it, teaching them more about why certain dress code rules are there, and definitely being fair on both sides, having dress codes for the boys, um, at Mina, we had, you know, shorts cannot be above your knees. You have to wear a shirt at all times, even in basketball. You can't have a sleeveless shirt for the boys as well, so that they felt like, okay, this is not targeting one gender over another. Uh, but speaking again about values rather than um, 
these practices? Like, where are they coming from? Why? What's the value? What is the concept of modesty? Is it the headscarf only? What is it like? There are, I mean, they're going to counter with, there's so many hijabis who do X, Y, and Z. They're full-time hijabi, but they go and they have a boyfriend. So you're going to tell me they're more modest than me? You know, you're going to hear this. So being open to hearing this, talking with them, um, it goes a long way. They just want to be heard. They want to have a voice. Great answer. We have another question here uh, it's, uh, from the messages. Thank you so much, Sister Ivana. This has been extremely insightful, uh, Brother Asad had mentioned here. My question is around motivational strategies. How can we help motivate teenagers learn more about their dean, especially to those that visibly show a demotivated demeanor that has become contagious to others? Any thoughts on how to battle this challenge? Let me just finish reading that. Um, so motivation, intrinsic motivation, the motivation that comes from inside uh, themselves is what lasts. Um, when it's enforced from outside, it, it, it's something that fades. As soon as that, uh, that uh, factor that's making it happen disappear, it's out of the picture, that motivation goes. Um, this is why even in Islam, we say connect to Allah, because if you if you get your deen high from a person, as soon as that person, you know, is out of the picture, you're, you never establish that relationship with Allah, right? So your deen goes down. Um, so the same thing kind of do it, connecting them to this intrinsic motivation is going to be the thing that ha that helps um, in the long run. Um, how do you motivate them to learn about their dean? Again, is by making it relevant and making it make sense. So we can go back to any of these strategies. Obviously, there's research, but you can go back to the dean itself and you can see how the prophet did it. Um, so he saw where people were and he taught in a way that spoke to that individual person and what they needed. We know of the stories that unfortunately, none of these stories are made relevant to us. They're told to us in a certain historical context and never translated to us. And this is what we do to youth and this is why they lose interest. I have sat through a khutbah where the Imam spoke for 45 minutes of why it's unlawful for us to eat the meat of a dead donkey that we found on the road. And there's principle in there that he could he could have focused on, but he never translated. He just focused on the story, and that's all we were told. For a young person in that audience, they're like, I don't have donkeys on the side of my road. So this is irrelevant. They tune you out. But if you focus your teaching on the principles and the values behind those stories, yes, you can bring stories to demonstrate what that looks like, what that looked like. You know, we know the story where somebody came and asked the prophet a question and he gave him one answer. And then somebody else came and asked the same question. He gave him a different answer because of knowing what that per where that person was and what they needed. One asked, is it lawful to kill someone? And he said, no. The other one said, is it lawful and will I be forgiven if I kill someone? He said, yes, because he knew that the one he saw anger in his eyes and he knew that he's asking for permission to go kill because he wants to repent after. So he told him no, but the other one had remorse in his eyes. And so he was already like, can I ask for forgiveness? And he said, yes. So knowing what our youth need and then being able to translate this knowledge to real applicable um, ways for their life is going to go a long way. So I walk into so many Islamic school where any of those kids, if I pull them out of the line, they can recite to me the hadith about being, you know, uh, your actions are by the intention. They can recite to me that smile is sadaqah with their frown. Like the teachers too, not just youth, right? So we teach, it's like the donkey carrying the books on its back. It's not really benefiting. You have children who can recite the entire Quran and then their value system is all lopsided because they've never really been 
taught to internalize any of these lessons, or they see it as just the storybook that happened a long time ago that has no relevance to me. Um, and this is why I was saying like, this has to be an Islam that um, stays long after these cultural practices um, have kind of dwindled out, you know, um, it, it, it just has to be made relevant. And I think that will motivate them to want to at least explore and not reject. Um, because what happens is that we, we do see where they just, this is not something that I want at all. And then they walk away. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do agree with adding the pressure on them to be above their youth peers. Um, Actually, I think the newest masjid research showed that a lot more of Muslim youth self-identify with their deen than um, other faiths. There are research like that, but they are still youth. They are still de dealing with the same negotiation, same brain development that, as, that everyone else. Um, part of encouraging motivation would be also just allowing youth to take some power back um, to write their own stories, to engage in, um, actively engage in asking questions. They, your classroom should be a safe place where they can ask and explore different answers. It's, it should be okay for them to say, well, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't really believe this because doubt, sometimes it's a necessary step to certitude. Right. So they need to go through, you know, you know, the moon is my Lord. Oh, no, it sets the, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the stars are my Lord. Oh, hold on. No, they're not the sun. It is. You know, so going through those steps to realize what is the right answer, bringing Islam to life. This is why sometimes, uh, you know, within Islamic school, I don't know if everyone is certified um, to teach because I think there's a certain certification. I don't know if everyone has gone through like um, an education background, but maybe allowing teachers the opportunity to get some additional training on, as I said, cognitive development of their students, but even then making sure that the educational is culturally competitive. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it has to be, um, it has to align with values, as I said, but it has to also be compelling, something that they themselves want to um, embrace. You have so much wisdom, mashallah, and, and thank you so much for sharing. We have held you way over time. I um, two, two more things, just to close if we can here. Uh, someone is asking here about any book suggestions that you might have. You did mention another book earlier in your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so all kids are our kids is, um, actually I have it right here. Hi, bro. It's this one. It's quite big. I don't know if it's all relevant um, to you. I've read and reread this multiple times. Um, I have a whole bunch of them here. The most uh, relevant ones in my work. Um, there is Does It Take a Village, which is the community effects on children. And um, a lot of it is focusing on families and the importance of family. Um, for schools, there is also uh oh i can't remember the name of it let me let me look through my library that isn't just here at my fingertips and maybe i can send you sister susan that you can send to the people who registered if i have other ones sure i'd be happy to share yes. that information if would you also put your email address in the chat yeah and then i'm also another question i will take right now is is it possible to motivate them by talk when practically everything that's happening around them in school or at home is not according to Sira and Sona? Is it possible to motivate, motivate them by, by talk? talk? What do you mean? Is by it possible to motivate them by just talking with them? I think what we're talking about here is, is the dichotomy of, you know, you get the message from your Islamic school teachers, mentors, 
But then when you have uh, your associations in the, the world outside of school, you've got a competition with that culture, you know, and many of the students we know are living dual lives. So is there some thing that, that teachers can do perhaps to acknowledge that this can happen and to help them bridge and stay uh, consistent throughout, you know, so there is a continuity from their school environment into their outer life. I don't think just talking is ever going to do much. Um, new information has never changed people. It, it, it might short lived, it might be short lived, right? Like I'm a convert to Islam. Um, so it was the information that brought me to Islam. But if I had stayed only at that information, I would have been long gone. <laughs> it's, it's something that's necessary on the path, but it's not enough. You can't just talk them into believing certain things. It, it, and I think this is where I hope you forgive me for repeating myself, but it has to be made relevant. You have to bring the real world to the classroom. You have to give them real life scenarios where they would be faced with certain decisions and okay, how do we make this decision based on our principles and our values, no matter what, because I mean the Sira there's principles in it that we learn. We're not repeating. We're not trying to go back to living that life in the way that they lived it. We're trying to bring those principles of that community to our life. This is why FIP has expanded, you know, with the new situations, with the new challenges. It's like, okay, so how do we now apply that value to what we're faced with today? So it's not about trying to get youth stuck into the past. It's saying, how can we take those lessons from the past and move into the future? Because when Muslims did that, we were in the forefront of the sciences. We were in the forefront of algebra and astronomics and every geography. We were the explorers, you know, Ibn Battuta. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, bringing these people who lived it into our curriculum we have the probably more freedom to do that than public schools do, right? Why learn about Marco Polo and not Ibn Battuta, right? You know, but then also when we're teaching history, be realistic with where Muslims failed and why did they fail? Because they didn't stick to values, but when they did, this is what they did. It all comes back down to values. Yes. Thank you so much, Sister Ivana. I've held you way over the allotted time that we had planned on. Thank you so much to everyone else for joining us. Keep, please. In mind, CISNA, we provide professional development, we do accreditation, we do advocacy, and we really do rely on donations to help us. So thank you for joining us today and may Allah bless you, Sister Ivana. Good luck everybody with the year ahead and may Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum.